about the amount of light that's coming in. Now these are 8 by 42s. What have you got there? Are they 10 by 20, those little ones? Some, somebody had 12 by 50, 10 by 50? 16, wow. 10 by 25? 8 by 42. So there's all different sorts of things going on there. 6 by 18. Right, what that means is this. I've got 8 by 42s here. That front lens there is 42 mils across. Okay, if you've got if you've got 10 by 50s, that's 50 across. If you've got 6 by 18s, that's 18 across. Okay, that is affecting how much light is coming in to your binoculars. The bigger this objective lens, the more light you're getting, which is great. Eight times means I've got to take that column of light and make it eight times smaller so that when I look at it, what I'm looking at is eight times bigger. Does that make sense? It's a bit wrong way around, but that's the way it is. These are 8 by 20s So there's a 20 mil wide objective lens and the 8 times means it's got to make it 8 times smaller. That means 20 divided by 8 is 2.5. So the amount of light coming out at the other end is 2.5 mil. If you've got 10 by 50s, 50 in, 10 times, 50 divided by 10, 5 out. You can see that if you hold binos up to your light, you'll see a ring of light there. That ring of light for me is just over 5 mil wide. If you've got 6 by 18s, it'll be about 3 mil wide. If you've got 10 by 50s, it'll be 5 mil wide. Can you see that little round dot of light? Yeah, in the middle. Yeah, right in the middle. Yeah. That's what your eye's looking at. That's for when you're wearing glasses or not. Oh, right. So if I'm not wearing glasses, I crank it down because the glasses are already at the right distance from my eye. Okay. If I'm wearing, sorry, if I'm wearing glasses, I have it down. If I'm not wearing glasses, I need to hold the binoculars out from my eye a set okay. distance. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you're wearing glasses and you have that out, you'll find you're seeing a circle. You're not seeing the whole thing and that will be frustrating for you. So, if you're wearing glasses, you're wearing them because something's wrong with your eye, you want the best amount of light coming in, use your glasses. Yeah. Unless it's they're reading glasses or something like that, or unless there's a very minor problem with your eyes, use your glasses. What if, you had, what if you've had, uh, uh, what do you call it when you have your eyes? Cataracts. 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 What? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, I've been there now. Yeah, the, it means you can see better. You can see better. You so, can definitely see better. Yeah. The, does that the, make any difference? Yes. The cataracts mean that the light coming into your eye is not all getting to the back of your eye. It's being mucked up on the way. Yes, yep. And so, no matter what happens with your binoculars, yep. your cataracts are always going to muck it up. Yep. Right. <laughs> Where does this become important? It becomes important when you think about what your pupil's doing. If it's a bright sunny day, your pupil contracts right down. It's really small. So if you've got 10 by 20s, if you've got those little, what are those little ones there? 7 by 25. 7 by 25. So that, that's working at about 3.5 mil of light yeah, coming yeah, here. Yeah, yeah. So out there on a bright day, my pupils might be 2 mil wide, which is great. I'm seeing all the light that's coming. As it gets darker, the width of that column of light doesn't change. It's still going to be 2.5 mil. As my pupil gets bigger, it's going to get to a point where my pupil is bigger than the column of light coming into it. At that point, my eye is saying, by the pupil getting bigger, I need more light yep. to see. If your binoculars are only giving 2.5 mil diameter of light and your pupil's 5 mil, what you're looking at through the binoculars is going to be really dark because you're only getting a quarter of the light that you need to see properly. Whereas if we've got another pair of binoculars and you're standing right beside and they're 7 by 50s, 
the column of light, 50 divided by 7, 7 sevens are 49, so it's just over 7 mil wide. The column of light is going to be 7 mil wide. So my pupil is going to be able to keep getting bigger and bigger and I'm still going to be able to see just like it's daylight. It's going to be really bright. Until my pupil gets bigger than 7.1 mil. And then I've got a problem. So those little glasses, they're good in really bright light. But as soon as you get to a duller light, whether you're in a forest or it's a late afternoon or it's a cloudy day, those little glasses, you're not going to see the same bird as I am standing right beside you with a bigger pair of glasses because I'm getting more light so my bird will be brighter than the, one, the same one you're looking at. So I'm going to see more. So when I'm choosing my binoculars, magnification is important and the amount of lights coming in is important. But there's a problem. The more light I get, the heavier these things get. The bigger and heavier. So that, that's... Yes. Yep. So the difference there is same amount of light but in what's going into your eye, but your magnification is different. And that's the other cost. If I'm looking through an eight times magnification and I hold my hand steady as I can, I won't get much movement. But if I go up to a ten times magnification and I've got any sort of tremor at all in my hand, it's going to be really hard to hold a stable picture on the bird. When I was young, ten times not a problem. You know, didn't even bother me. But as I get a bit older and as your tremor gets a little bit worse, the need to shift to the eight times binoculars is important. If you've got really stable hands, go for the 10 times. Great, because you're going to see that bigger magnification and you're going to get more light. But if you want to deal with what's happening to, to the tremor or whatever, your stability, then eight times is, is going to be better for you. The other thing is, if I've got 10 by 50s, because it, they're 10 times magnification, instead of me looking at that big an area to find the bird in, it's going to be that big. So I've got to be far more accurate at finding the bird. So if you get 8 by 40s or 10 by 40s or 8 by 50s or 10 by 50s, you've got two consequences there. One is magnification and light and the other one is tremor and field of view. So you've got to balance that up. Which one do you want? And the only way you can work that out is to go and try a few. So next time you're in Adelaide, go to Adelaide Optics or something like that and try out the binoculars and see which ones work best for you. Or over the next few weeks, I'm going to have these available every week. Try them out and see what's good for you. And then the decision comes down to how much can your pocket afford, how much do you really want it, all that sort of stuff. But that, that is something you guys need to work through to choose which binoculars are going to be best for you. This thing saying to me here is 12 by 50 yep. 5.5. That That's the yeah. angle That's between that. one side and the other of your okay. field of view. Okay. Yeah. Next thing. So I was telling you if you wear glasses you have that down. If you don't wear glasses crank it out so you can actually hold it the right distance from your eye. A few other things before we get into a bit more of the important stuff. Um, some of us have eyes on the side of our head. Some of us don't, like me. If your eyes are really close together, some binoculars just don't physically close up enough for me to use them. If I'm using binoculars, you know, in the old movies, they used to show you a, a sort of um, field of view that looked like that. They'd put the little slide over and you'd look through. That's not what you want to see when you're looking with the binoculars. If you've got your binoculars working right, you will see a circle. Okay? So you need to adjust the width for whatever your eyes are so that you're just seeing that nice round circle. Next one 
can I quickly get you to do a little experiment without thinking much about it? Just take your right hand and point straight at that. Just as quick as you can. Just point straight at that point there. Okay, shut your left eye. What happened? It's shifted off to the side. Now do it and shut your right eye. So, some of us, good evening. Sorry, um, I'm Greg. Neville. G'day, Neville. Um, I'll get you some paperwork and that later, but yep, I'll give you these for the moment. And we're just learning how to drive. Okay, next one. Because our eyes are different, you know, you go to the optometrist and this eye has to have that and that done to it and this one has to have the other thing done to it and a few others. When your optometrist sets your glasses up right, by the end you should be seeing as best as your eyes are capable of seeing. Which means that all things going well, you shouldn't have to adjust these binoculars too much. But typically our eyes are different and one eye dominates over the other. So we have to allow for all of those things. On your, all of your binoculars, if you look on typically the right eyepiece, but not always, maybe the left eyepiece, you'll have a negative, a little dot and a positive up on the top of the eyepiece. Can you all find that? Yeah. And opposite that negative dot, and it will typically be a line that moves on a, a rotating collar. And if you rotate that collar, the length of that eyepiece will change. Okay? That's how we compensate for the differences between our eyes. Now, I, I spent a bit of time today trying to get one particular binocular that was set right over on the, the left unlocked, but when we did, suddenly that pair of binoculars that only worked with the left eye worked for both eyes. It, it, it's amazing how that those things can be set in place years ago and never changed. What we're going to do now is just show you how to set it up perfectly for your eyes. And then each time you use your binoculars, just have a quick look and make sure it's in the right place. So, using the eyepiece that is not the one that has this on it. So if this is on the right eye piece, looking through your left eye, have a look. Can you see that sheet there? Whoops. <coughs> have a look with your left eye. It doesn't want to stay there. Okay. <laughs> Okay, have a look with your left eye at that and use the top focus, the main central focus, to get it perfectly in focus. Or choose something around the room that works for you. When you've got your left eye perfectly in focus, just using that top focus, stop for a second and, and look at me and I'll, I'll show you what you have to do with the other one. Can I borrow yours for a sec? Okay, so you've used your left eye. Ah, oh, that's odd. That's the other thing that you get. Some binoculars focus really close and you need to check that when you buy them. Some binoculars don't. You, and if you can't get close focus with birds, it's a bit useless. So, you know, you want to be able to focus on a bird up to two metres away. Um, now, what we're going to do... On the right eye, I've got this adjustment which has the plus and minus on it and I can rotate that. The first thing I'm going to do is rotate it so that the marker is right in the centre. And then, using just my right eye, look through the right eye and rotate that, not the central one, rotate the one on the eye until it comes into perfect focus. Go back and forwards until you get it just right. Right. 
Look at the same object because it's set up for that object. Now if you open both eyes it should give you that nice round image and it should be crystal clear for both eyes. Ah, that's no good. And that's just with that eye. So it works for the other eye. Well, the only the two, only the two, only yeah. that movement and that movement. Yep. So with your left eye, you focus with this one. Yep. Yep, and that works beautifully. You get a nice clear yep, image. Where am I? Uh, go on. Nice no, one. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm getting there. I'm getting there. Yep, I'm with you. Yep, now with your right eye, yep. just shut your left eye and, and just look in with your right eye. Move that one until it comes into focus. I'm with you. I understand. Yeah, but it's not working. It's not working. Okay, well that, that's always going to be a problem. Yep. So only your left eye is going to work, basically. Yep. Oh, well, uh, there's a reason for it. Yeah. Macular. <laughs> okay. um, when you've got those two nicely set up, the next challenge is, when you see people use their binoculars, one of the big mistakes that you often see is People will put, they'll see the bird over there, they'll put their eyes down and look at the binoculars and then they'll lift up the binoculars and try and find the bird. What you need to be able to do is look straight at the bird and without moving your eyes off the bird, just lift your binoculars up and there it'll be. So choose an object around the room, look at it and then lift your binoculars up and if you're doing it properly it should just be there. And it takes a bit of practice and then you focus on it to get it right. So choose a few different objects around the room and move around and just practice that skill of not using the binoculars to find the object but using your eyes. Yep. Yeah, you never have to adjust that eyepiece again if it's right for you. Have a look at it and just check exactly where this line has ended up. If it's ended up over here, then that eye is getting a... If you look, you'll see it's a bit longer than the other. Oh, if, I was going to ask you that. If one line is longer than the other... Yeah, so that's how it should be because it's allowing for both eyes. If the line is saying it's giving this eye a bit more of a focus or, or that one a, a bit less, yep, then what it's doing is changing the length of that tube to shorter or longer than the other one. And that's compensating for the differences between your eyes. They're not perfect, yeah. And, well, they're perfect for reading, but yeah. Which one is your left eye? Which one? Yeah, this one is both eyes once you've got it set up. Okay. So, so this is the left eye. Your left eye, you're setting this one up, and because you're adjusting that, you shut your left eye and you're using your right eye to adjust that okay. one. Okay. Yeah. When you pick up your binoculars next time, just make sure it's in that place. Or if it's not, have a quick check to see that that's where it should be and move it back. And sometimes. Depends on the pair of binoculars, but if one's being knocked a little bit, it'll push it one way anyway, and it, that's just the way it is. It's not your eyes, it's just the way the binoculars are. <coughs> okay. Now, that, that sort of rushes you through it, but 
it gives you an idea of how to set them up properly for you. And then the key thing is it gives you an idea of why or why not your binoculars are not giving what you want. So if you've got that little pair of binoculars, they're useful, they're handy, they're light, but if it's a dark environment you're going into, they're not going to work for you. It, it, it's a compromise. So if you're taking those to go up to the rainforest up north to do your birding, you actually want a pair of binoculars that's going to give you a column of light coming into your eye that's big enough for the pupils to get all the light that they need in those low light levels. Okay, so 7 by 50s, you've got a 7.1 mil light, 50 divided by 7. 8 by 20s, 20 divided by 8, you've got a 2.5 mil column of light. So your pupil can only get 2.5 mil before the binoculars are not giving you enough light. It depends on for different people, but it's probably, yeah, uh, up around that 7 or 8 mil. Um, and you will notice it on those, you know, those uh, cloudy afternoon evenings when you're looking at, at something with your binoculars and, and everything starts to go dark at some stage and that's because you, your pupil's got too big for what's coming in. Um, but 8 by 50s 8 by 40s the ones that are around at the moment tend to be 8 by 42s they, they're, they're really quite good for most of the light levels that you'll want to deal with. Yeah, so 8 by 42 you've just got over 5 mil of light. Um, and then as you move, you know, if, if you're out wanting to spot warplanes in an evening before they attack you and you want to be able to pick up the slightest glint at, at a maximum distance, then you need maximum light. So. That, that drives a different imperative. Not quite so important for birds. So these little 50 should be, I should see an aeroplane coming at me pretty quick. You, you'll, you'll see good magnification, but as the light gets darker, you'll lose some of that um, ability to see because 12 by 50s, you're looking at about a bit over 4 mil. Yeah. If you see the ones they use on those ships, they're monstrous binocular things that are sitting on platforms to hold them stable enough. Okay, uh, any questions on all of that? Given you enough well, knowledge? I've been told uh, the manufacturers, uh, when they polish the glass, um, I was told by a guy that was virtually a professional, yep. that some glasses are polished and when you look through them, it's a lot, lot clearer than some other, they, they, I think they were like parts, I think. Yep. And the other ones were, um, or another brand anyhow, which he said were a lot, a lot better quality. quality. Yeah. yeah. And that better quality will be better quality grinding, but yeah. it'll also be the covering, yeah, yeah. the coating yeah. on the lens. Yeah. And. Like with, um, glasses, like yes. Stuff yep. Yeah. 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 If you want to spend your thousand dollars, it's all possible. Yep. Uh, I've got to. Yeah. Uh, it gets worse. We all have that one. You're at a very good age. It all gets worse. Okay. Um, don't we know it? <laughs> There's a lot of money in glasses. Now. What, what we might do then, just go for a walk around outside. I just want to make sure that everyone is quite comfortable using the binos to just point on different objects at a distance and even if we see a few birds moving past, just the idea of watching the bird flying and keeping your eyes on the bird as it flies rather than watching your binoculars and then trying to find the bird. If you, if you can teach yourself to do that over the next 10 weeks, that'll be a really good outcome. That, that ability to find the bird within a second or two is the difference between IDing it or not. And yeah, we need to practice those skills. So, um, what's the easiest way out of here? Out the back or out the. Out the back. 
a little bit about the, the birds that uh, and the bird books that are available and then after that we'll go into identifying the birds and I've got a whole bunch of these bird books that you can use if you don't have one here of your own. So we'll, we'll go through that and I've given you two lots of handouts. We'll use these tonight. What I suggest you do is bring along a little plastic sleeve sort of pockets in a book or something and you'll, you'll get one of these each or two of these each week, just put them in there. The other thing that's sometimes useful, particularly when we're going through the bird species, is taking little notes to remind yourself. So if you've got a little notebook or something to, to take a few notes in, you might want to think about that, but up to you. Um, but certainly you'll be getting some of these each week and, and after 10 weeks it builds up to an annoying amount. Yep. Um, right. Okay. Just to take you back to that year 10 science that you all did in year 10, I'm sure. Just a quick little run through classification. It's changed a lot year since... 11. It was year 11? <laughs> it's changed a lot. Um, we, we no longer talk about two kingdoms, the animal kingdom and the plant kingdom like we did back in the 60s and 70s. It's changed a, a fair bit from that. And then we went from two kingdoms to five and, and now we actually have a, a much more complex understanding and, and there's all sorts of kingdoms in, in quite a range of groups. So it, it's a bit more complex than, than what I'm going to talk about. But the, the aim is just to fill you in on, on a few things that will be useful as we go through the course. So we've got the, the animal kingdom which is things that are not bacteria, things that are not plants and a whole range of others but animals, um, the, the main ones we're interested in at the moment are, are just the, the, the chordates and the vertebrates. So phylum chordata, chordata is, is a group of animals that have a, a a big main nerve system running down the, the back of the animal. Not all of those have a backbone. The ones that do are in the, the vertebrate group. So phylum chordata, subphylum vertebrata, that's one of the, the group that we are in. Then you've got the jawed vertebrates. There's about 60,000 species of those in the world. And a part of them are the classes like the birds, the aves, or the reptiles, reptilia, or the mammals, mammalia, or the amphibians, amphibia, and then you've got the various types of fish and whatever. But we're just interested in the birds, the aves. And then the birds, there's about 10,000 species. Depends on who's doing the classifying, in, but there's about 10,000 species in the world. Some, some will give 11, some will give 9,600, but depends on who's, who's doing the classification. Probably a few more than 10,000 now that genetics is sorting them out. Then you've got different orders. And there's a whole bunch of orders. There's 23 orders. One of those orders are the perching birds, the passerines. And those passerines is about 5,300. So over half the birds in the world, the species, are in one of the 23 orders. There's 22 other orders that we'll talk about in a minute often referred to collectively as the non-passerines because the passerines are so common. So kingdom, phylum, class, order and then we split things up further. The next one that's useful for us are the families. So in this case we're, we're just going through to the yellow robins and they're a part of the family that includes all the Australasian robins. The interesting part about most of the passerines in the world is when they were originally being classified in the 1800s, it was thought that the birds in northern Europe were the ones that had spread down into the southern hemisphere. But when you started looking at genetics and what was going on there, it turns out it's the other way around. Australia was the source of a lot of the passerines in the world. 
some came from Gondwana land into Australia, some came from Gondwana land up through uh, Africa and, and they've led to different types of, of patterns around the world but the most dominant group are the ones that have come from Australia and they've gone out and populated the rest of the world. So our birds turned out not to be the weird ones but to actually be the source of a lot of them. And the ones that were called robins here were called robins because they were a little bit like the robins over in Europe or America. But it turns out that ours are quite different. They just look like robins. And so there's a whole bunch of groups that are quite different that are Australian based. Then each family is split up into subfamilies and, and then the next major group is, is the genus. And in Australia there are two types of robins in that genus that includes the yellow robins. There's one that is the eastern yellow robin and then there's a western yellow robin. On our peninsula we happen to have the western yellow robin which we're the most easterly location for the western yellow robin. And then there are those two species, they have a scientific name which includes the genus and the trivial name and the western yellow robin. And then within that group, there are two subspecies. That is, they, they're, they're really similar and they probably could interbreed with each other. One of them's found on the Air Peninsula and the top of the southwest of WA and the other one's found in the lower part of the southwest of WA. And we can split those apart. If we talk about subspecies, we have the species name and then the subspecies name. Now, do we have to, do we have to remember those names and spell them or what? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's homework. We have a test before you depart. No, it's with with the the um, the birds. The, the, most people just use the common names. The challenge with common names is that they change depending on where you are. So um, you all quite happily called that thing flying past tonight a galah. But up at Woodna, they don't call them galahs. What are they called? No. Cockatoos. No. Bad names. Bad names, no. <laughs> they, they talk about an animal that shares the crop with them. Share farmer. Oh, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, so yeah, yeah. there goes a share farmer, yeah, yeah. says one when I did my first course up there a couple yeah. of years ago and I said, a what? <laughs> and uh, yeah, share farmer, that's the local name for them. But there's a whole lot of local names and, and even more importantly, a lot of people learned the names from their grandfather and, and they just gave them names because they wanted to name the birds they were seeing on their property. And so you have all these local names all over Australia that are quite different from each other. But they'll only have one scientific name. Um, and at various stages in our history, the RAOU, Royal Australasian Ornithological Union, sat down and they came up with the common name that would be applied to that bird throughout Australia. And that, as you can imagine, led to some significant yeah. arguments. Yeah. And that name, you'll find that name is the one that appears in the book. Okay. But they'll often have beside that other common names as well, also known as... And so once you get to classifying them as species, does that mean then that the subspecies can um, you know, partner up or agree? Or Sometimes the subspecies becomes really important and I'll talk about that in a sec and, and we, we actually talk about... A, a different grouping because if we're talking, for example, with birds like the emu wrens that are found at the bottom of their peninsula, that, that's a subspecies of a, a group of emu wrens that are found right across southern Australia. And there's another similar emu, emu wren that's found over in the Mallee on the Victorian South Australian border. Um, they're never going to get to interbreed with each other. They're different subspecies. And so when we come to look at them as far as conservation goes, we need to recognise that that's a little bird for which a gap of one and a half metres between bushes is like a chasm. They don't cross it very easily. So to cross a kilometre of cleared paddock, it's not going to happen. 
If they've got interconnected bush, they will move up through that bush. But the likelihood of them on EP moving right up around Port Augusta or even worse, flying across to York Peninsula and then to the Flurio and then heading up into the bush and up into the Mallee there is zero. So we then talk about those subspecies in a conservation terms like their species in a way and we have a special name for that. And, and so in the end we talk about what we call ultra taxa and that's the idea of, of a species and a subspecies being quite similar sometimes in the way we treat them. Even though the southern emu wren is found right across southern Australia, the populations are really isolated and there's only small numbers of them. We're talking hundreds or maybe thousands. But if they were to get together, would it's they breed? Would they breed? Probably they would. They're genetically quite similar. Mm -hmm. And the, the thing about the genetics is, to, to give an example, if, if I take this sheet of paper with a whole lot of writing on it, and I give one copy to you and one copy to you and you start scrubbing out a few letters. You might be scrubbing out different letters and you might be writing in new letters. But if I took it back before you'd totally defaced the whole thing, I could actually look at it and see that they had a common origin. Even though I'd have changed one bit in one way and another bit in another way, I can tell that they've come from the same origin. And I can actually look at it and see what it originally said. If you then gave a copy of what you'd done to a few other people and they started changing it, and you gave what you'd done to other people and they started changing it, we could still trace it back to the, the common origin. If you, if you looked at it, and even better if you applied a mathematical understanding to it, you could start to sort it out and tease it apart. If we think of that page in the same way as we think of the genes on the DNA of the species, if you take the original page, the original species, a long time ago, and think about how that DNA has changed as we go through time and new species appear and look at yours, we can actually realise that the, the DNA in both of those lines has come from the same original source. And we can see that you know, that A there has been crossed out here by you, but it hasn't been crossed out by you, and, and we can trace it back. And you can also see that that A must have been crossed out early on because it's present in all the other ones from you on. But it wasn't crossed out in you and other changes are present all the way on. If you can take the DNA and actually look at all of those millions of base pairs and they can do it now with amazing precision and speed and really, really cheaply, then you can follow through the DNA and look at what's happened to a whole bunch of species. So what I can do is I can head out across Australia and collect everything that looks like a yellow robin and everything that looks like a, a red-breasted robin and, and so on and I can go and look at all of their DNA and compare them. And for the yellow robins I find the differences are quite minor. They're closely related. The documents that have come from someone nearby, the DNA is very similar. But if I look at someone else, the red robins, I can see that they had a common ancestor but at some point they split off and the changes that have happened have been different. Yep. And I can do that right back through all the birds and I can look at a common ancestor and then you can get pretty tricky and start to work out how long ago they split and, and things like that and that can give you a bit of a timeline. And the, the, the power of the genetics to do that is beyond belief now. You know, you, it's like a little chemical kit. You, you take your cells, you grind them up a little bit, throw them in a machine, boom, get it, get the answer. It's, it's all really quite fast and, and fascinating. And we're going to use that idea in a minute just to help us understand what's going on with these bird books. So, <laughs> all the, the birds, there's 23 orders in the world, 23 different groups of birds. It's like we've handed out that sheet 23 different times to 23 different people. Does that make sense? Yep. There's been a common ancestor and there's bits of sheets have disappeared all along the way but there's 23 basic lines. One of those lines is the passerines and it's a really big part of all the modern birds. 
but there's 22 other parts, whether it's the grebes or whether it's the ratites the, or, or things like the emus and that, they're all different groups. Yeah, it is amazing. But it means that a lot of the birds are cosmopolitan. So you get a lot of the seabirds that are found all over the world. So if you've got a turn here and a turn in America, they're in the same group. So yeah, the 23 orders, they're all here, every one of them. But the 142 families in the world, we've only got 101 of them. So things like hummingbirds, we don't have hummingbirds, but they're a whole group of birds all by themselves and right through the Americas, you get your hummingbirds. But we don't get hummingbirds here. So those families, their names end in D-A-E. If you look, what I did about four years ago was I made a list up of all the recordings of birds in Air Peninsula. And this is extracted from the Biological Database of South Australia. Biological Database of South Australia has about 4 million records for all of the animals in South Australia. And that goes back a long way. That goes back 100, 150, 200 years, depending on the data. And then comes through to now. So these are the count of all the records for Air Peninsula for each of these species. If you go to the very last page, you'll see the 65,000 records for birds on Air Peninsula as of February 2014. Okay, we've since added probably seven or eight thousand. So, of the four million records in South Australia, we only have 65,000 of them for birds, yep. and that's the most commonly studied group. So, our records are quite small compared to what's available. The other thing is, if you look at something like the yellow-tailed black cockatoo, which is the page before, about a third of the way down. It's in the... Yep. Yep. See the case forms? The, yep. There's 3,000 records of yellow-tailed black cockatoos. But if you look above it, or down below, glass, there's only 1,226 records for glass. No. <laughs> <laughs> but those, those 3,142 records were based on 33 birds. So, why have they come up with that figure? So, there was a lot of research done on those 33 birds to try and work out why their population was collapsing. And they did a lot of work that was really neat, it showed possums were eating their eggs and all sorts of things. There wasn't enough food, so the hakeers, people went out and planted hakeers and all that sort of stuff. And so there's been a bit of work on that. It's a, it's a vulnerable species. But then, the glass, 1,200 records. Yeah, well, there must be less than 33 glass in all of Air Peninsula, you'd think. <laughs> and that gives you an idea of the bias. And you can go through and there's all sorts of really common species and people just drive past them, never record them. Yeah, yeah. We don't know. You know, I talk to farmers and they can all talk about when the uh, rainbow lorikeets arrived on EP or, you know, suddenly they're there and that was... Yeah, they're, they're common as mud now, but they weren't common as mud 50 years ago or 60 years ago. Yep. No. The biases that we've got here mean that we really don't understand what's happening to all the different birds on Air Peninsula. We, we have birds that are really quite common, but because they're seldom seen, people just would have to know their call and write it down and hand in the information. We don't get records of them. So I can't go back and look at the data from 50 years ago and say, this bird was really common back then, it's now really rare. Or converse, this bird was really rare back then and now it's really common. Or, we are, yeah. So, what I'm trying to say with that last column is, we don't know much about our birds on Air Peninsula 
and it'd be really good to start collecting some useful data. And that might be you going out into your backyard and just recording what you see twice a week, or it might be driving out into Hinks and, and doing some surveys or whatever. But getting people to start collecting information is what we need to turn this all around. And even better, trying to get it systematic and organised. The, the other thing is I've taken all the 302 species that have been recorded on Air Peninsula. I've laid them out in orders, alphabetically organised, and then within each order, families, alphabetically organised, and then within each family, in genera, alphabetically organised. So that will give you a useful list. And if you find the rare spangled drongo and it's not on this list, go back and have a look. It might not be the rare spangled drongo. It... Well, it's a spangled drongo, yeah. Haven't you ever seen that drongo? No. No, there's drongos. Yeah, what a great name though, eh? Uh, common ostriches were wild breeding for a fair while in South Australia. They were introduced and the, the, you'll see if they're introduced or not in here. Uh, okay. Yeah, so in the same way that the sparrows, but if they're, if they're self-sustaining in the wild, not in the cage in the backyard, then they're an introduced feral species and so you need to be aware of that. Everything. Yep, everything. And then of those 101 families, 43 of them are passerines. So one of the orders has 43 of the family and the other 22 orders have the rest. So passerines are what? Passerines are the, the perching birds, the songbirds. And they're, they're the common ones. They, they're distinctive because their vocal cords are very, very complex and they can sing. Whereas most of the other 22 orders have really simple vocal cord and they honk and they toot and they squawk but they don't have that complex ability to sing. So would a magpie be? A magpie is a passerine, yeah. Or your lyrebird is a very ancient passerine. So what about menu then? It does... So it's just got that throat vibration. It, it, yeah. When when I talk about how birds vocalise, I'll talk about the structure of the. It's called a xerinx, not a larynx in a bird. And I'll talk about the lung structures and how that's very different and why they can do what they do. And the passerines, as a group, all have that really complex xerinx, and that's why one of the reasons they're quite distinctive. Okay. So talking too much. 9,700 species or 10,500 or whatever, it, it varies and, and you'll see differences and as the genetics gets better, it tends to grow because we're able to separate things out that look like one species but aren't really. There's 842 in Australia and its territories. Those territories are islands offshore. There's 482 in South Australia about 303 non-passerines and 179 passerines, seven introduced and six introduced. And then on Air Peninsula, of those 482, we've got 302 that have been recorded. Okay? And that's from the Biological Database of South Australia. The that's the Biological Database of oh, South yep. Australia. Yep. Yeah. So as you go into the desert country, you get some birds appear that are not recorded here. Uh, some of the shorebirds, the seabirds, don't come here, not very often. Uh, and then as you go down to the southeast, there's a whole bunch of species down there that we don't get here as well. Anyway, 302, that's a good starting point. 10 weeks, 30 a week. Yep, it's all doable. Blackbird's starring. Blackbird. Blackbird. 
Um, um, there's pigeon? No? Um, what is it? Um, pigeon? Yeah, feral pigeon. The feral pigeon. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, it, it's got a proper name and we'll talk about that proper name. But um, Right, now, in um, 2008, they finally got the genetics together for enough species and they could actually do a meta-analysis and pull all the data together. I've given you a copy of this in two halves. Yep. And they were able to look at the relatedness of all the different birds. Now this is not all the one 10,000 species, but it's a large proportion of them. And if you take the ancestral bird back here and look at its DNA and compare it, well you're not looking at its DNA, but if you work out what the ancestral page must have been like, you know, what was the, the original data, and you look at the changes that have happened, if, if a change happens here and it's present in all the others, then you can say with a fair degree of certainty if you look at a whole bunch of genes that these birds must have come after that one. So you would start with that information and say everything comes back to one bird. To, to a, a, a group, a population, yes, back long ago. So that could have been true? Uh, <laughs> 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 not if you tried to fit them all on. And, and there's a whole lot of disappeared in the meantime. So there's many, many challenges. But if you go back, the birds that have most of the characteristics that are ancestral to all the others are the paleognates. And they're the emus, they're the things like the ostriches, they're the things like the South American ratites. Uh, um, what am I trying? Cassowary. Uh, cassowaries come a little bit later. But they're, they're those really primitive flightless birds. They don't have the sternum with the big muscular layer like we see in overemphasized in our chooks, but that, that really thick, powerful layer that allows the wing beat. They, they have a much simpler setup and the feathers are a little bit more basic. As we go through, we get branches off and then the, the next lot with the, the set of characteristics that are most basal to everything else are the things like the ducks and geese and waterfowl. They're very primitive in a lot of characteristics. They retain a lot of those original characteristics. Things like the megapods. So what's the megapod that we have on Air Peninsula? Loves to big build big build big mounds. Valley fowl. So they're very primitive. Quail, guinea fowl, pheasants, frog mouths and night jars. Um, they're very old. Swifts and tree swifts, hummingbirds and things like pigeons, doves, grebes, and as we move around, we finally get to one really big branch here that continues on and covers a large proportion of the families that are found in all the birds, and that's the passerines. So these are 22 of the orders and a whole lot of families within those orders, and then this is the last order, the passerines, and these are all the families within the passerines. So it starts here and goes that way. And they've put it like this because if you unfold it, it just covers too big an area, so they've wrapped it into a circle. That, that series of branches gives you an idea of the relatedness. As we move out here, do we get to individual species? So each one of these little lines at the very end is an individual species or genus. And, and as you move down in time, this, these steps away happened earlier than these ones that are further out. Okay? So you've still got species that have formed in hummingbirds quite recently, but the original hummingbird-like creature that branched off from some other, other creature it's still got that set of characteristics all the way up through the chain that the original ones had. Okay, so 
Why am I telling you all this? Well, these field guides, if you go to bird number one at the front of the field guide, it's a paleognath. If you go to bird number 842 at the back, except for the rare vagrants, which I'll just get past, they're the passerines, the most recent passerines. So that order unfolds through this book. As we start up here, that's the front of the book. As we go around to the back, that's the back of the book. As you go through time, <coughs> yeah, we're not doing all 10,000, that's the advanced course. You might have to pay me for that one. Uh, okay. Um, and that's why they're in that crazy order. Okay, and it changes. If your book's 20 years old, it won't include this, they'll be different because we didn't understand it quite as well. If you go back far enough, the quail and the button quail are together in the front of the book. But if you go to this book, the quail are at the front and the button quail are in the middle because they've worked out that they're quite different. The is pages on the book are very different. So that book there is the, the latest edition of the South yes. uh, Air Peninsula and I'll show you how he got one there to be the edition before yeah. and they'd be different. They should be, but, but even worse, there's not 302 species Probably not in there. No, so, wouldn't all be in it. Yeah, so that, that's a good starting point. Yeah, yeah. But now we're stepping up. Yeah. This is, yeah, this is, anyway. yeah. <laughs> um, and the problem with that one is it's only one picture. And, yep. you know, yep. Yep. The, the next thing about these books is this is a really condensed version of the information that we have. So, Where'd I put them then? My big pile of books. No, that's a little pile. That's a little pile. Ah, they're up the back, sorry. Right up the back. Okay. When you create your field guide, sorry, you take all the knowledge that we have on birds Now, this is, this is a, a gem of a series and I've brought three of the nine volumes here tonight. This is the handbook of Australasian, Australian, New Zealand and Antarctic birds, often referred to as HANSAB. And HANSAB is a set of nine volumes and it's about that wide. And they started in 1993 with the first volume and they finished in about 2006, 2007 with the last volume. And that summarised all the known knowledge on Australian birds at the time. So if you go into each one of these, it has about 8 or 10 pages, or 20 or 30. This is the cicada bird. It tells you about all the key characteristics of its field identification, the habitats it occupies, it cites every reference at that time known, gives a detailed analysis of its distribution, threats, how it moves across Australia. It talks about all the social behaviours, about the calls, about all the known breeding characteristics, plumage. It talks about the molts, geographical variation, and then it cites all the references. So is it online? No. should be. Um, yeah, you have to sell your body and soul to get one of these nowadays, sadly. But that's the total known knowledge. It's yay high. It's a huge body of information. And for each bird, they give the pictures of all the different subspecies. They give the pictures of the different molts, so the immatures, the non-breeding, the breeding, the for each one of them, where they can. And it gives these amazingly detailed pictures. But I can't carry that much information into the field and I don't want to. And it would destroy us. So the guys who produce these books 
have to get down to the key bits of information that you need to identify a bird. And that's it. Now, it's got better as time has gone on. So if you've got a, a volume prior to this, this is 2012, this is the latest field guide in Australia. There's a whole lot of other field guides, but they were all produced before 2012. And that's the challenge. Oh, I should say, that's a pictorial representation of those different groups of birds. It's not exactly the same. Sometimes things have swung around in different ways, but it gives you a rough idea of, of the species across Australia, uh, across yeah, the world. And yeah, I've talked to each of those. So field guides, they will vary in quality. They'll vary in the type of pictures produced but they'll only give you one or two pictures of what is a really complex setting and they won't show you all the intermediates and that's a challenge and different books do different things better and worse but the real challenge is that as we've identified more species and as we've increased and changed our understanding of the genetics more birds have entered into this or less in some cases. So the older the book the less useful it is. Twenty fourteen. Twenty fourteen. Yep. Um, there is a new one that's just being produced, a totally new book by the CSIRO, and I think it'll be better again, knowing the authors, and it'll do the plumage a lot better than all the past ones have. And they've, but that won't be out until May. But in the meantime, this is the most up to date one. Uh, yeah, and if you go on Andrew Wiles' website, you can pre-book it. But what I'm going to suggest is, with the binoculars, over the next three or four weeks, you try different ones out. And in the past, what I've done is, I've done a bulk purchase for people. So I've ordered 20 or 30 pairs of binoculars, and it's amazing the discount you can get if you order bulk. Um, so be aware that if you're looking at getting some binoculars, try lots out. Try them out in Adelaide, think about it, and we'll, we'll do a bulk order if people are interested. If you're not, it doesn't matter. And I'll do a bulk order for books too. And so we can order these or we can order the new one that's coming out, um, but that won't be until May, unfortunately, if you want to hang off till then. Um, and, yeah, we'll try and get you a discount. Usually it might be 5 or $10, depends on how many we're ordering, but um, the power of... 20 people or 30 people ordering is much so greater. The books? Uh, 45? Yeah. Did you? Who's your friend? <laughs> anyway, on special, yeah, I, they usually are. And it, I think they're probably going to be trying to clear a lot of these at the moment before the other one comes out. And the other books, will, if the, unfortunately, Graham Pizzi died about 10 years ago. Um, he was a brilliant field naturalist. Uh, his daughter produced this one and they updated it as best they could, but they didn't update the field notes as much. And so, um, but his, his ability to describe the natural world and, and what it is you need to know was, I think, unsurpassed as far as all the different field guides go. But we'll see what this new one does because these guys are pretty hot as well. So you're uh, saying, Greg, we need to replicate all the same books? Sorry? No, we, we don't need to, but be aware that there'll be some um, grass wrens that I'll put pictures of up here. Yep. They won't be in that book. They'll be in that one, but they won't be in that one because they weren't identified as separate species when that one was made. So that that's just the change that rolls on. And, and yeah. Um, <coughs> say again. You'll live that. Yep. And and that's the reality. Um, but I, I change from. Um, I can't remember the previous books. Not Simpson and Day. It's. Um, no, not Slater. Um, I changed up when, which was the previous most up-to-date one, I changed up when I'd made about 30 species name changes and additions. So it, it just rolls on. And, and if you want to 
keep up with them, you, you need to roll on. So that, that's the, the most current one. You, you'll get these other ones around. Ah, that's right, Morecambe. I, Morecambe I, I really love because he's really good at identifying the key characteristics you need to learn to identify the birds. His paintings aren't as good as those that are in Pizzi's book. I don't think they're as good for, for all the species. Some are better and some are, many are, are not as good. The colours aren't quite right. Steve Parrish, yep. Now I think he did something on the introduction or something like that. Ford, maybe? Anyway, the, the, the books evolve and, and get better. We're really fortunate in Australia. We've got some really good field guides. There's, there's many of them. But if you go back, the dates are getting quite old. So some of them are 15, 20 years old. The, the version, there's been reprints, but the original version... Is, is quite old. And they map them quite, they've done the human genome mapping them. Yes. Do they do that with birds? Yes. Oh, that's what we were talking about. Well, no. They've done genomes for specific birds, okay. the whole genome, and then within it they've selected particular parts of it to do for all birds. Oh. And they've, they've looked at, because, yeah, the, to do the whole lot took, say, for chickens and whatever took two or three years with 20 or 30 teams all over the world working together to, to get the whole genome. But yeah, they, they know a lot of it in real detail and they know what a lot of the genes do. Um, yeah, it's quite a fascinating world to get into. Um, right, the main groups, uh, I've talked about some of these already. The flightless birds, got cassowary, kiwis, rears and that. Rear was what I was trying to think of before. Um, megapods and waterfowl. Penguins, another group. Tube-nosed marine birds, those ones that have the spectacular beaks with the complex plates all through them. Um, the grebes, which have lobed feet rather than webbed feet, so nice big fat toes basically so they can swim in the water. Tropic birds. Grebes and tropic birds are fascinating. They're not really designed to walk on land. Have you ever seen a grebe run along the ground? It's sort of a... It's a the feet are right at the back. They're not actually centred in the middle and they can't really walk properly, so they sort of fall forward. It's, and tropic birds are the same. Uh, storks, pelicans, ibis, gannets, birds of prey, like the raptors. Uh, the falcons are now in a totally different group. They appeared separately. If you look on that chart, you'll see that the raptors are in a different place from the falcons. They're still put together for ease, but that's the only reason. Cranes, rails and relatives, some of those ones I showed you before. All the shorebirds, uh, button quails appear closely related to them. Pigeons and doves, cockatoos and parrots, cuckoos and their relatives, owls, nightjars, swifts, kingfishers, and then one of those groups is the pastoral. The part that's quite interesting is all those different wing shapes basically come from the same feathers. Okay, so you've got between one and a half thousand and up to six, seven, eight thousand feathers on a bird. The ones that have lots of feathers are the bigger ones. It takes more to cover the same surface area. If you've got something like a swan, of those six or seven thousand feathers, five or five and a half thousand of them are from the neck up. Just because you've got this long thin neck, it's hard to cover. But the bird's feathers in the wings are all quite similar. And the first step we're going to have this week is learning those feathers. Because if you can start to think about the feathers, your identification of a lot of birds will be a lot more effective. So, a bird's wing. Pretty much all birds have ten primaries. Some have nine and there's a little vestigial feather tucked away in the background, like the appendix, doesn't do much. Some have eleven, but most of them have ten. You start counting them from in here and you'll see a notch as a bird flies over, you'll see a notch where the primaries end and the secondaries start. This is number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And that's the basis of most birds' wings. That's half of the wing. 
the outer half. Then you've got the secondaries. The number of secondaries changes between species. If you've got a big long wing, the way you make it long is throw in a few more secondaries. The way you make it shorter is take a few out. Then, above those are what are called the covets. The secondary covets, often referred to as the greater covets, but we'll talk about that more next week, the primary covets. Then you've got the marginal covets. And there's a group of feathers that sort of act to connect the wing to the body. They're sometimes called the scapulars or tertials, is another name they give for them. Then there's a funny little group of feathers that are attached to the thumb of the bird. And they sort of sit separately. Uh, some people, if you're used to chooks, people call it the bastard's wing. Uh, its proper name's the alula. Okay. Those feathers. Uh, it, it, it could be the top or the underside. Okay, so you have upper wing covets and under wing covets. And they're sort of the same. The thing about the covets is a wing works because of the shape of the wing. And it works because the airflow over the wing is different underneath and over the top of the wing. So if you have airflow longer over the top of the wing, then underneath, the air gets a little bit spaced out on top of the wing, so the pressure drops. Under the wing, it gets squeezed up a little bit, so the pressure increases. If you've got a lower pressure up there and a higher pressure down there, it's a push. It's, it's, it's a lift. So the bird goes up. To keep that shape, you need the primaries and the secondaries in the right way, and you need the covets holding everything together giving that nice laminar flow over the two surfaces. The neat part about the wing is, like most of the vertebrates, whether it be a reptile, whether it be an amphibian or a mammal, you've got the same bone structure. Okay, You've got the humerus, and then in the wing you've got the ulna and radius, then you've got the carpals and the metacarpals, and there's even a thumb there. They've lost most of the finger bones, the phalanges, the metacarpals. They're down to one. There's a second one that's sort of half there. That's your wing. That wrist, that's where the primaries come out. So when a bird folds up its wing, the primaries are here. And all the other feathers tuck in behind. Neat little concertina. Yeah. So these ten feathers that we call the primaries are actually coming off from the wrist down. So think of your bird, think of the way the wing folds up and it's just that. Okay, then the secondaries, they're coming off the middle wrist up to elbow bones ulna and radius. Okay? Then you've got your tertials and your quaternaries. But thinking like that, you can start relate to what's happening in your arm to the bird's wing. Now, next step, those bird books, that's what you see every time, isn't it? It's sitting out in the sunlight, you see it in perfect profile. It's showing you exactly what you want to see. It sits there for the full three minutes that you take to identify the page and find the bird. And it's just perfect. But the reality is, you get that, you get it for 10 seconds and it's gone. And we need to start to learn what it is that we need to look at straight away. Okay? How do I work out it's a robin? I look at that big buff head, that nice round eye and that really well plonked in beak and I know it's in that group. So the first thing I'm seeing is that it's a robin and then I'm looking at, if it's a yellow robin, I'm looking at where the yellow goes to. The difference between the eastern yellow robin and the western yellow robin is this white patch in there. So 
I'm looking at what I need to look at straight away. But there's a whole bunch of birds. I'm not going to be looking at anything like that. I'm going to be looking at a totally different set of structures. I might be looking at the feathers in the wing. If I'm in North America and I'm dealing with some of the weird and tricky groups up there, I might look at how long the secondary feathers are compared to the primary feathers. I might be looking at the covets, the greater covets that just sit that part of the wing. And I might be looking for one or two feathers that are a different colour that help me to identify the bird. Most of our birds aren't that tricky, so it's, it's a lot easier. But if I'm thinking about the primaries or the allula or the covets, I'm starting to see different characteristics already. Look how long that primary is compared to the secondaries. Tells me something about the wing shape. But if I'm looking at a shorebird, the primaries will be down here. I've got a really long, thin wing. And so the primaries are long, but the secondaries are short. So when I find my, fold my wing up, primaries go all the way to the end of my tail. The secondaries are just little things in here. It gives me a long, thin wing. If I've got a broad, fat wing, it's more like this. And so this bird can fly vertically. You can see it flies straight up and straight down. Ask a shorebird to do that and you're asking the impossible. But a shorebird can fly 14,000 kilometres in four weeks non-stop and never land and get to Russia and breed there twice a year. Who knows? So there's a whole lot of characteristics going on which leads us to this. Today we're going to do those raptors, the diurnal birds of prey. And we're going to concentrate on that one part of the book and by the end of it, you'll have flicked through those pages 40 or 50 times at least and I reckon by the end of it, you'll know where the birds are pretty well just for those 10 or 12 pages. I've got a whole bunch of bird books up there so if you don't have one, I'll give you one. 